when you go to American Atheist or whatever, or you go to like FFRF, you never know who you're going to meet at those conferences. Like some people have, you know, the fame's gone to their heads. I know YouTubers where the fame has just gone to their heads and they're, they're lost. They have lost their sense of self in what they produce. And it's tied to their performance. Like their, their self-worth is tied to their performance on YouTube now. And that's, that's a bad way to go. Because guess what? The algorithm will eventually not favor you. It might right now. It will not forever. And the fact that you tied your self-worth to your performance here is a virtual... It means there's a virtual guarantee that you're going to crash and burn emotionally. And you're going to be a dickhead between now and then. And, and obsessed with yourself and believe that you're the best in everything. At any of these conferences, you get people, like, constantly... Like, I couldn't stand in one place... Which is, you know, it's fine. I, like, I love meeting people, so it's, I'm not complaining about it at all. I'm just describing the uh, experience. I couldn't sit in a single place because if I did, I'd be swarmed by, like, a billion people who now see me, you know, free. And they're like, oh, I got to talk to them, you know. So I was, there were a couple of times where I did that. I sat down at a table and just hung out and chatted with people for a while. But it, a lot of my hanging out was done in the room because sometimes, you know, there's a lot of, there's like overload. But everybody that I could take pictures with or whatever, I took pictures with them and I even posted them to my community post. Like I've, like I said before, and like I've said a thousand times, I'm gonna say it again. I'm just a normal person. I am not special for real. I'm just some dude, okay? I'm just some guy who was lucky enough to be in the right spot at the right time that the algorithm favored me in 2016, like eight years or eight, yeah, eight years ago, March 11th, 2016, when I started my channel throughout 2016, it was sheer luck that I did what I did and having the opportunity presented and taking that opportunity when it presented itself. That's, that's it. That's really all there is to it. It could have been anybody to step into that role. I'm not like the, the smartest or the best or the only guy who could have done it. And I don't, I don't, I don't view myself that way at all, but others do. And I recognize that. So, you know, when I find somebody who is like exceptionally nervous around me, which is actually pretty common, Anytime I'm at AA Con or anywhere, um, I get people who are like shaking coming up to me and, and very clearly like super nervous and they don't know what to say and they're like wringing their hands and everything. I don't view myself that I'm not worthy of that. I am exactly like every other dude at that conference. I'm just some dude. That's it. And there is no reason to be nervous. So I try really hard to put people at ease and, you know, tell, chill, you know, help them make, you know, help them feel more comfortable and, and realize that I'm just normal and just ask normal questions, be a normal person. And um, that helps people sometimes kind of calm down. And, and I understand there's going to be like a lot of nervousness and that's OK, you know, 100 uh, percent fine. So anyway, there's a girl that walked by me and. Usually when you introduce yourself, you know, you, you stick your hand out and you say, hey, my name is Owen Morgan and I'm blah, or it's great to meet you. I love watching your stuff. My name's blah or something like that. Well, this, this girl was so super nervous that she like, it seemed like she didn't want to talk to me at all. In fact, a lot of people just didn't want to talk to me at all because they didn't want to bother me, which is not how I view it. If you, bother me. If you see me at a conference, bother, come up, talk to me, say, hey, I would love to talk to you. But this girl was very obviously nervous and she didn't introduce herself. She didn't anything. She just said, Owen, I watch your channel. And then just kept walking. I was, you know, I, I tried to get her attention. I said, wait, wait, what's your name? You know, tried to draw her out and talk to her. And she was, uh, you know, kind of, she came out of her shell. She, Calm down a little bit and stop being as nervous after she realized that I'm just some f asshole. And we took a picture together and I posted it on uh, social media and places like that. And uh, yeah, 
So if you ever come up to me at a conference, don't be nervous. I'm just some dude, okay? For real. I'm just some guy. Uh, and in addition to being just some guy, I've seen the fame go to people's heads, and it has not gone to my head. I recognize that I'm no smarter or better or anything than anybody else. Cats keep me in check. You know, the cats make sure that I know that they're, they're better than me. So anyway, it was a fun conference overall. I, ta I got to talk to some Mennonites, some Amish. Quick note before we continue, I want to let you know I just wrote a book. If you want to check it out, owenmorgan.com slash book. It's a book about my experiences within Jehovah's Witnesses. It's completely understandable if you know nothing about Jehovah's Witnesses. And if you're a Christian, it's a good reference to use for why Jehovah's Witnesses are wrong about their interpretation of the Bible. The last chapter of the book is 100 questions that I have for the governing body. I'm selling the last chapter separately as its own separate guide if you guys want to get that too. So check it out, owenmorgan.com slash book. I'd appreciate that. The person named uh, Mary, Mary Byler, Amish misfit. And this is a shout out to Mary, the misfit Amish. That's the name of the YouTube channel, the misfit Amish. You know, shout outs aren't worth a whole lot unless you run a campaign, but I'm at least shouting out Mary, I think that what you're doing is phenomenally good. I'm really, really proud of you, Mary, for doing what you do and for talking about this. I met, well, you know, I didn't actually meet a woman named Jasper, but apparently Jasper has a podcast with a million downloads. I didn't get a chance to talk to Jasper, but anyway, met another dude named Randall. He's a Mennonite, ex-Mennonite. They're all under the same umbrella. They're called Anabaptists. And I met another woman who left the Mennonites behind. I'm sorry, uh, the Amish, the Amish. She left the Amish behind. And my God, dude, some of the stories that these people have are wild. I mean, you shouldn't compare stories. My story was hard, too. Mary's story was hard. We, we've all had a hard time making it through, right? But I'm really, really proud of Mary for getting as far as she has she got to speak on stage at American Atheist, and I'm so glad. I was there for it. I was first one in the room, and I was sitting there, and I listened to the whole thing beginning to end. And it, it was good. Did a great job. Uh, and they got a standing ovation, even. People stood up at the end as they clapped. That's not super common. I, I don't think I've, I remember ever seeing that in American Atheists. Real proud of you, Mary, if you're watching. I don't know. I'm real proud of you, Randall, for telling us your story. It's not an easy thing to do. Bottom line, they, it, you know, there were a few. I think there were three ex-Anabaptists who were, um, who had a part on the American Atheists, uh, like, program or whatever. The Catholic Church kind of roughly create, you know, created the papacy, started their own pope or got their first pope or whatever around 538 ce like common era so 538 and martin luther would not split off from catholicism officially into protestantism until 1516 somewhere in that vicinity and then shortly after the protestant split and when i say shortly i mean within 10 years there is another split of the Protestants. Now it was a break off from, you know, it, the Protestants split in half and they became Anabaptists, one of these groups over here, Anabaptists, that's what it was called. They were persecuted heavily, obviously, but there was like real persecution, like they were being beaten and all kinds of stuff. So they kind of like as, uh, as a social group moved, I, I believe to the East, and there's a lot of German and Russian influence in all Anabaptist communities, uh, Dutch influence, stuff like that. Eventually, there was another split in the Anabaptists. Some Anabaptists stayed in Europe, and some came to America. And, you know, they became the Amish, basically. And then there was another split with the ones in America. I don't think the Europeans split, but the ones in America split into Amish and Mennonite. The, the main difference was Mennonites 
were a little bit more, just a little bit more relaxed and a little more willing to like work with the outside world or use electricity. Um, they didn't like shunning. I think that shunning was one of the key things that kind of broke the barrier between Mennonites and Amish. But they have a really, really positive reputation on the outside world, and they should not. They should not. The Amish, to give you the cliff notes, let me put it this way, okay? The Amish control entire communities, and sometimes it, it covers a lot of land. I would love, uh, you know what, I'm going to try to get Mary on my podcast. Or, I'm sorry, I'm going to try to get Mary on as a guest one of these days. Sometime very soon, I want Mary on as a guest to talk about this with me. But they control entire areas, like large swaths of, like, Pennsylvania or Ohio or whatever. And there are commonly, like, five different districts within the same little community, five different churches or or five different like uh, bishops or whatever, from my understanding. And sometimes the Mennonites will live tangential to or right next to the Amish communities or even in the Amish communities. Uh, they'll be like part of it. They'll have their own church, but they'll operate with their own machinery and everything. Be a little bit more technologically, you know, savvy, more, more willing to use technology. And there's this whole thing, I forget what it's called now, but there's this whole thing in um, Amish culture where, and it, again, this is part of the positive like reputation that the Amish have. This contributes to it. You're allowed to leave, go out into the world, use electricity, um, listen to music, you know, watch DVDs, watch movies, live your life for one year, and you come back, and then you, de you, know, you decide, do I want to be Amish or not? Well, that's not really how it works, actually, as it turns out. People can't just, like, have no money, have no education, effectively. Can't even read English sometimes, some of these people, because they're getting their education from their Amish community. And what do they think is important? Well, they think the Bible and biblical doctrine are important. They don't think reading is important. They will interpret the book for you. By the way, that's exactly why Protestants split from Catholics, because Catholics would interpret the book for you anyway. You really expect somebody like that to come into the world, like the, the outside world, and live their lives, have a job, have an apartment, no credit history, no nothing? Really? No, that's not how it works at all. Really how it works is you are free to roam around to different churches and districts in the area. And, oh, maybe you can go to the Mennonite um, district if there's one nearby. And you can use electricity for a while. You can meet new people and hang out with them for a year. And then you come back and you make your decision. It's not really like people get to go out and live their lives on the outside world. That's not how it works. The point is that Mary escaped and she went through some real horrific experiences. Let me give you the cliff notes. This is my same complaint with Jehovah's Witnesses leadership, okay? Here's the deal. Every community has people who are going to take advantage of children in it. Every community. They all do. It's like a rule of life. Every community is going to have people who take advantage of children. Now the question is, how are you going to deal with it? when you find out. Jehovah's Witnesses in the 1960s decided to handle everything internally. Everything is a sin, not a crime. By the way, that's one of the problems with the Amish too. It's viewed as a sin, not a crime. Child abuse, CSA, sin, not a crime. We handle things internally. We don't involve the police in anything. That was the sentiment in 1960 with Jehovah's Witnesses. And then in 1990, they implemented fully, or in the 90s, the 80s, and 90s, they implemented fully the two-witness rule. Again, I talk about all of this in my book, by the way, like the history of, of all of it and how we found out a woman named Barbara Anderson, what happened to her. She was disfellowshipped, and her husband disfellowshipped, too, for not being able to control his wife. No joke. Uh, I talk about it in my book. OwenMorgan.com slash book if you want to read the book. I would appreciate you taking a look. Delivery times are really high, but it's not actually going to take that long, I don't believe. I'm just having it formatted right now as we speak 
final draft is done. I'm working on a book cover right now, cleaning it up, and yeah, so it'll be out soon. Anyway, Jehovah's Witnesses decided you need two witnesses to the, the sin, not the crime of CSA, child sexual abuse, but the, the sin of CSA. And that was in the 80s or 90s. I don't remember which. So with like both refusing to communicate with the authorities and the two witness rule where you need either two witnesses or two victims to uh, a, a crime or a sin as they view it, those two things combined created a massive loophole that protected people who mistreated children like rampantly. I mean, I'm sure you can see the loophole. If there's not a second victim to, to the crime of uh, child mistreatment, you know, CSA, then they, they literally say nothing. They, they pretend it didn't happen. They assume the accusation's false in Jehovah's Witnesses' case, right? That's a two-witness rule, and that, that's the loophole that it created. So people would go to a kingdom hall, they would abuse somebody, they'd get accused, or, you know, maybe they weren't accused, but they would abuse somebody, they would move to a new kingdom hall, and that would never be mentioned to anybody. It wouldn't even be like, you know, it would just be like dead silence. Nobody would say a word about it because there weren't two victims. So as a kingdom hall, you can't say a word. So the person moves to another kingdom hall, they abuse somebody new, and they move to another, abuse somebody. I mean, this happened for years and years and years and years and years. It's still kind of happening, honestly. Like I said, CSA exists in every community. The question is, how are you going to handle it when it happens? The answer for Jehovah's Witnesses is, or was, whatever, apply a system, apply their own system of governance to the situation. And their system of governance, whether it's Bible-based or not, they claim it is, it's not really. It, it, it's full of loopholes, and we don't need that anymore. We have DNA tests. We have, like, rape kits. We have all, all kinds of stuff. We have, D, you know, we can subpoena people. We can issue search warrants, go through their homes, go through their computers, go through whatever if we have probable cause and, and if we have, you know, a reason to do so. Why are you applying something, the, the two-witness rule, that is completely, like, worthless in our modern age? You should be telling the secular authorities, call the police. You hear something happened? Call the police. Again, I talk about all of this in my book, owenmorgan.com slash book if you want to take a look. The really, like, gutting part, the really disgusting part, I mean, this, by the way, this relates back to the Amish. I'm going to get there in a second. You'll, you'll see the connection in a second. The really disgusting part about Jehovah's Witnesses is that the Elder's Manual, the Elder's Handbook, has a section instructing elders of different congregations to maintain a good relationship with the local police district or the police station or whatever. Send two elders from the hall over to the police station to chat with the police, introduce yourself, make, you know, make sure they know who you are and everything, just in case there's like a fire or there's an emergency, you know, you got an earthquake and something bad's happened. You know, the elders in the congregation already, already have a rapport with the police. I'm not even joking. That's 100% real. That is actually in the elders' manual. They, they instruct elders, two of them, to, from a kingdom hall, go talk to the police and introduce themselves in cases of, like, natural disasters or emergencies or something so that they, they have a rapport. But... They didn't instruct them to call the police in cases of child sexual abuse. That's kind of weird, isn't it? Completely left out. What they did say in, I'm not sure which edition now, but it's been an ongoing problem for years, decades. What they did say in, that, in one of their handbooks at one point was basically, if there isn't a second victim, walk away. Don't say a word. Just leave it in Jehovah's hands is actually what it said leave the matter in Jehovah's hands, which means do nothing. It actually said that. The book did. The Elder's Handbook. I have it quoted in the book that I wrote. You can download the, Elder, the Elder's Handbook and read it yourself if you don't believe it. And the even more disgusting part about Jehovah's Witnesses, they thought that they were being progressive when they implemented the, you know, this thing, because this is an exception. 
Like, you know, CSA, child mistreatment, the way that they do this is an exception. The two witness rule dictates, uh, dictates that two people see something happen, the same thing, the same event. In the case of CSA, it's not the same event taking place. It's two different events, two different witnesses, and it's only a single witness to, you know, one specific specific event. So the elders who, the governing body who implemented this, they probably thought we're being super progressive. Yeah, we don't need two witnesses to one event. We'll settle for one witness to one event and another witness to a second event. If there are two events, then it counts as two witnesses. Wow, super progressive. The loophole still exists, and it still led to people being disgustingly mistreated. Like, why don't you just involve the secular authorities, for real? Why don't you just bring them in on this stuff? Why don't you involve them, people who have DNA tests and stuff and, and can lift fingerprints, have a fingerprint database? Why don't you involve them in this crime? You're involving the police for other things. Why not this? I don't believe that Jehovah's Witnesses, the organization, the governing body, I don't believe that the governing body is like pro-pedophilia. I don't believe that they are in favor of children being abused. I don't believe that. But it damn well looks like it because of how they structured everything and how they, it's like the system is like built to protect CSA perpetrators. Anyway, the Amish community, or communities, multiple, and Mennonites have a similar problem. It, it may be even worse than Jehovah's Witnesses because they're all insulated. They have their own rules, their own, uh, their own everything. Like, you, you know, they have their own jails and their own schools and all of it, the whole nine. So in cases of CSA, you're just out of luck if you're Amish. DNA tests, that's of the world. That's technology. We don't want that. And, of course, the, the, there's a little section in the Bible about two witnesses you know, it was expected that it was going to be used for things like if people, you know, buy a donkey from somebody or whatever, you got to find two scribes who can witness the transaction take place and witness the contract signing or whatever and witness the exchange of goods, money for a donkey. If there aren't two witnesses there to witness like a financial transaction, it didn't happen effectively. That was what the two witness rule was for. But there is explicitly an exemption in the Bible for the mistreatment of women or kids. It, it explicitly says the two witness rule does not like apply to these types of cases. And the victim is 100% innocent. The Bible says this in Deuteronomy. Yet Jehovah's Witnesses and like um, Anabaptists or, you know, people from the Anabaptist uh, like... They call themselves plain people, P-L-A-I-N, plain, because they dress plain. They don't wear stripes. They don't wear flowers. They don't, you know, they wear the head coverings and the whole nine. Um, now it's, you know, an Anabaptist is like a plain person. Anyway, plain people or Anabaptists, they have a very similar system to Jehovah's Witnesses. Again, I don't believe that Anabaptists or plain communities want, I mean, the leaders of those communities, I, I don't believe that they want to protect child abusers. I don't, I don't think that. But you could have fooled me. It looks exactly as it would as if they did. Seriously, it blows me away. What? Why are you doing this? Anyway, take a look at my book if you want to read more about this. And it's going to be in audio form very soon. It's going to be released very soon. owenmorgan.com slash book if it's not, not already out. And for the record, um, Mary, the misfit Amish LLC, the leader of this, Mary here. See if we can just watch a, a short clip from her. So, gather round. We're going to have a little chat that's kind of serious in nature. First off, like, I can't speak for all plain people because there are many different plain people. I can only... You remember, plain person is anybody who is, you know, Anabaptist, basically, a Mennonite or whatever. ...speak about what I know, and what I know is about Abe Troyer and, like, Old Order Amish. With that being said, the number one thing that I think medical personnel of all types would need to know and realize and understand is that a lot of us, English is our second language. 
Yeah, they speak Pennsylvania Dutch. Uh, I, uh, M- Mary does, at the very least. That was, that was their first language. I believe they're non-binary, but also go by she, if you want. So she or they. I, I could be wrong on that. So if I'm wrong, I apologize, Mary. But that, that's what Mary goes by. That's like the name that they use. So, Therefore, we may utilize English differently than, say, somebody who grew up speaking it primarily. Like for me, I didn't learn English until I went to school. And even then, I was very limited for years on how I could communicate. Right. So they learn English in school. Two, that basically, from what I've heard, two secular subjects and then six religious subjects that they learn, doctrine and stuff. Uh, the two secular subjects are usually something to do with learning the English language, just learning to speak English because they speak like Pennsylvania Dutch or some other, uh, their own version of a German dialect, basically. And, you know, some other, so, you know, they'll teach them how to read a little bit sometimes. It depends. But they don't know how to read well by the time they become an adult, just enough to do what they need to do, usually. When I was a small child, um, I'm not exactly sure how old I was, trauma brain and all. I was taken to a medical doctor. I still remember the doctor's name. And as somebody- uh, I'm not sure. Mary may be referring to like an actual medical doctor. It sounds like that's what, what she's referring to, to me. An actual medical doctor. On occasion, Amish or Mennonites or whatever, they have to leave the commune. And commonly there's like a phone, one phone in the community. And if there's like an emergency, like somebody is dying or some serious thing is happening, they'll use the phone, they'll call a taxi, they'll get the taxi to bring them to a hospital or whatever. Um, It does happen from time to time, not very common. So anyway, I'm assuming that Mary's saying that they were taken to a doctor, like a real doctor, not the Amish doctor. Um, I'm not exactly sure how old I was, trauma brain and all. I was taken to a medical doctor I still remember the doctor's name. And as somebody who has worked in medical since like 2005. I believe Mary left um, Amish in, in 04. I know what they did. They took me into a separate room. They asked me questions. And when I could not communicate adequately enough, they... Because English is a second language, she didn't know how to tell anybody what was happening or what was going on. They asked me questions, and when I could not communicate adequately enough, they brought my mother in to translate. I do not recommend doing that for several reasons. One, she straight up lied to the interviewer. Mary, in her book, again, it's free on Kindle if you want to check it out. I think it's called... um like, she's not paying me for this endorsement, by the way. It's necessary that I say that because, um, you know, for, I think, FCC reasons, I have to make sure everybody understands I'm not being paid for an endorsement right now. I'm just, you know, I'm a fan. But she wrote a book and published it in 2022, and I personally know how hard it is to write a book, so I'm very proud of her for that also. You know what? Let, let me see if I can pull it up on my, um, like, my Kindle store, because... I was reading it earlier. The Amish Misfit, I think is what it's called. Reflections and memories of an Amish misfit. Quote, my therapist says that's not true, but I digress, end quote. That's kind of the tagline. That's the name of the book, if you want to find it. And it's on Kindle Unlimited, which means Mary is paid basically for every page that you read. You can read for free. If you have Kindle Unlimited, you can read the book for free. And each page that you read, Mary is paid a certain amount. I think usually, basically, from what I know of the book market, usually Amazon charges $10 per book, and they take, they give the creator 70% of that, so they take $3, you get $7. If somebody reads the book from beginning to end, then Mary gets $7 for that. How many pages she got? 155? So divide that by 155 pages, what do we got? So she's getting uh, four and a half cents per page that you read, basically. That's what what Amazon is paying Mary for you reading her book for free on Kindle Unlimited. So I I do hope you check it out. Again, I'm not like she I'm not endorsing her. I'm not being paid for this. 
this isn't like me making money off of anything. I, I haven't been paid for any of this. I just really like Mary's work, and I, I want to give it some, some light because it's a it's fascinating, and b it needs some light shed on it. Really, reflections and memories of an Amish misfit. Mary Byler, give the book a read. It seems really interesting to me. Anyway, the the problem ultimately with both the Amish community and the Mennonite community and with the Jehovah's Witness communities, all, all of them, they're all protecting people who commit CSA. Uh, is it intentional? Do they like, like, child abusers or something? Uh, it, no, I don't believe that. But it sure as hell seems like it by the way they're creating loopholes and stuff. It's wild. Some people I know, are like, I know a lot of people in this space, okay? A lot. I know Aaron Ra, I know Matt Dillahunty, I know Mr. Atheist, I know all everybody, practically, I've at least spoken to once. And, you know, many of, of these people just message me all the time. You know, Seth Andrews talked to him the other day. I know a lot of people at the very top of this field, and I know many of them to whom the fame has just gone to their head. For the record, the people that I named just now... The fame didn't go to their head. You know, Matt Dillhoney, Aaron Ra, Seth Andrews, so on and so forth. The fame is, didn't go to their head. It's not a comment on the people I mentioned. I'm just saying fame goes to people's heads really quickly. And it's like Z-list celebrity stuff, too. We're talking YouTubers in a very niche area of YouTube. But fame goes to people's heads anyway. So I don't find myself rooting for somebody to succeed very often on YouTube, on podcasts, on whatevers. Very, very rare that I, you know, I, I might believe in the cause, but I, I might also know that this person behind the scenes, just personally, I know they are so full of themselves. It, it's like obnoxious. I don't feel that way about, about Mary. There are a lot of people I hope to see fail because they're so full of themselves. And it's just annoying at this point. I don't, I don't see that from Mary. I want Mary to succeed in what she's doing. Not only do I believe in her cause, but I believe in Mary. And, and I believe in Randall and, and the others that were there. I believe in them. And I want them to fight and believe in themselves. And I want them to get a little bit of attention and as much attention as they can get, you know? I want them to succeed. I want them to be known by broader society. I want Mary to go on Dateline. She did in, I think, 04. Maybe. Uh, don't quote me. I want Mary to go on big YouTube channels. She has. You know, 5.3 million subbies. The underbelly, I think it's called. I want Mary to succeed in fighting against the Anabaptist movement that is deeply, deeply harmful to people, and also fighting the good reputation that Amish and Mennonites have. Like, why, why is their reputation so good? It's mind-blowing to me that they have such good reputations. I viewed Anabaptists like Amish, you know, plain people. I viewed them positively for a long, long time until, honestly, probably recently. But the communities are predatory and damaging and violate human rights left and right. They don't even like care about human rights. That's not even on their radar. What's on their radar is getting you to heaven. And that doesn't mean that you need to learn English or even know how to do fractions. It means you need to know these religious doctrines. That's it. Anyway, I hope to see Mary succeed. And I hope Mary sees this.